So hello everyone, welcome to um, the final session of um, both the Strength Based Learning Programme, but also what is likely to be one of the final sessions, if not the final session from the new System Alliance itself. So I just wanted to spend a bit of a moment reflecting on that, uh, I don't worry, I won't spend ages on it. Um, just to say, you know, this has been a four to five year project funded by the National Lottery in partnership with Mayday Trust and the Homeless Network Scotland, um, and has been um, a very wide ranging, uh, very um, kind of, I think, really exciting project where we've delivered lots of events, lots of conversations that can challenge bringing people together, offering bits of training, consultancy support, highlighting different things in different organisations and lots more besides. And it's been a real, real journey. I've learned a lot as an individual. We've learned a lot as an organization. And I hope people who've been logging on to all the different things we've been running uh, feel the same as well. Um, we are hopeful that this learning program uh, is something we can repeat, but with different uh, topics. So um, probably not once a month as it's been um, over the last year, but probably every two months. And, and we're hoping that that'll be a partnership between platform um, and platform well-being. So platform well-being being our uh, kind of training and consultancy uh, arm of the organisation uh, would still be free to access. And what we're really hoping is that we can have these regular every two months conversations with a presentation and reflection as we're going along. So do keep in touch on our mailing list that you're part of um, and do, you know, uh, let us know at the end of this session. I know uh, Rachel will be sending out um, to everyone who's ever been to an event, an evaluation form for the whole new system alliance. So if you've got time to fill that in, that would be really helpful because we want to see how best we've contributed to system change and how the differences we've made really across the UK and across the world uh, from sunny Australia. So um, yeah, lots, lots of things we can learn. Um, but today um, we wanted to talk about managing the um, emotional complexity of endings, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful, but then it is also a significant challenge that I know a lot of services, if not all services, face. Um, so my name is Oliver Townsend, I'm Head of Connections and Change for Platform, and my colleague. Hi, I'm Sarah Brown, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm an associate of Platform. And I also work for a health board in Wales for an Iron Bevan University Health Board in the community psychology team. And I work entirely into a children's social care service in Blyna Gwent in the Valleys. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, so uh, my disclaimer, rather than an apology, having said we're a strengths-based group, is um, I have a disability. I'm in a bit of pain today, so you might see me shift shifting around. So um, apology. Nope, there we go. I knew I, knew I would apologise. Yeah. Anyway, so I will be moving around a lot and that might be distracting, but that is why. Um, so um, a little bit of a history of strength-based working at Platform. And I think it was really important that we talk about the fact that it's really got its roots in our partnership with Mayday Trust. Um, and um, in January this year, Mayday Trust began the process of, of merging with Platform. So Mayday Trust journey in terms of strengths-based working um, was several years ago, and they asked a first question of people they were supporting, which is, what do you value about what we do? Um, and they asked loads of people that they were working with. And, and the, the answer that came back uh, was, um, excuse the language, but sweet FA, we don't like anything you do. And actually most of what you do makes us feel worse. Um, so what Mayday Trust then did, um, which is different to what a lot of organisations would have done, other organisations might have said, well, they didn't quite understand the question, or well, maybe they don't understand the pressures we're under, so maybe that doesn't really matter. What they actually did was say, okay, fair enough, we got that wrong, um, so what is it you do want? And people fed back then that they want to, you know, the things that shouldn't really be a surprise, but continue to be a surprise across our sector, is we want to be treated like people. We want to have a say in where services go. We want to be able to talk about our own dreams and hopes and ambitions. We want to be listened to and not judged. We don't want to have one size fits all solutions, et cetera, et cetera. And from that came the person-led transitional strength-based way of working, um, broadly summarized as, a, as PTS. Um, and along that journey, uh, platform, um, myself at platform, wanted to test that in our organization implementing a coaching approach, the PTS approach. Um, and at the same time, Mayday Trust were undergoing an evaluation by the new um, economics and, and 
anyway, it's gone, but it's in the next slide, so I'll remember it. Um, an evaluation around uh, the impact and how PTS works. Um, and that dis discovered essentially a lot of barriers that we already were aware of. And some of those barriers that we'd heard from platform coaches and PTS organizations and Mayday partners throughout the New System Alliance, those have all informed these six sessions. So people have talked about they need to understand mental health, they need to understand how to demonstrate impact. But one of the things that came up consistently was if you're working in a strength-based way and building a really positive relationship with people you're supporting and you're trying to get people to realize their ambitions and what they want, when is it appropriate to step back? How do you step back? And how do you manage that, both with the people, but also um, in a conversation with Sarah, that question really filtered to the top, which is actually, is this more about us as well? You know, how do we as professionals let go? So very quickly before I pass on to the real star of the show, which is Sarah. So uh, we looked at our coaching um, and this uh, valuation report, New, Econ New Economics Foundation, there we go. So they demonstrated that PTS does help to increase and improve well-being. It does provide a respectful, dignified experience, and it helps people with that idea of them taking ownership, taking charge of their own kind of support journey within, obviously, each individual system's limits. And also that it helps people uh, gain access to additional services or the right services for them, because coaching is both a support element, but also has an element of advocacy. So people who might not be able to speak up for themselves at that time, at that moment of their life, um, are able to support, uh, get support from the coaches. And we found very similar in our own experience at delivering it in platform. So people still need services or support. You know, there was a while where we were talking, could coaching replace services? Well, our, our, our learning in platform is that it can't really do that yet. It, in a dream future, it would. You know, we would have a series of coaches helping people um, in the way they want it. But actually, sometimes you still need those statutory services uh, to provide some element of um, expertise uh, or clinical uh, support or um, other kind of specialism. Um, particularly for us, it was that people's goals may not be the one we think they ought to want. And that has been a big challenge to us as well. Uh, and we've got had some really good experiences of that, which I can share at the end during discussion. But there were two key challenges identified by the evaluation report. And um, obviously the first one we've talked about a lot during these sessions and throughout the New System Alliance, which is the systemic issues. So how do we challenge those systemic issues? And that's not what today is about, but I didn't want to ignore it. The second one is exactly what we are talking about today. So the clarity around ending that coaching relationship, uh, what support is available post support. And we do talk about PTS here, but it can apply to any kind of support. You know, what is that consistent approach to the working relationship? And that's why um, we have Sarah uh, today and hopefully during discussion, we can um, kind of explore that a bit more. So I will just want to spend a very brief moment thinking about well, when we talk about um, in PTS or coaching or support, we often talk about ending system dependency. And it's become a bit of a buzzword or a buzz phrase, hasn't it? That we've all assumed maybe that system dependency is a bad thing, you know. And, and I know the, um, I've probably tried this before, but Mayday Trust used to ask in training, they used to ask professionals, who would you call on if you had a, a crisis, a personal crisis? name five people you would you would ask for help and uh, people would tend to say mum dad friend sister brother partner husband wife cousin you know and they would tend to find people that they would call on for support again a very significant generalization but that was one of the things that happened quite often when they asked people that they were working with people they were supporting the answers were more generally uh, focused on Things like my support worker, my probation officer, my CPN, um, my um, case worker, my probation officer, whatever it was, people tended to go more towards professionals. And so one of the key things about PTS was saying, well, what system are we building, which is setting up people's crisis um, kind of support network to be made up of professionals? Often that's because people need to rebuild their personal networks completely. So it's understandable. But that must then feel very strange if we're creating a support network based of professionals and then consistently giving the message to people that at some point that support might end. 
because the rest of us in in our kind of personal crisis uh, world do not have the idea most of us some some people do that our personal support networks will suddenly end in an arbitrary 12 months so some of those thoughts um kind of on, on the page i won't go through all of them are, are things and we will share the slides afterwards um are some of those kind of the artificial drivers between um, kind of natural endings that come because people have reached a, a, a helpful point in that relationship and maybe the system driving that. So you only have 12 months, you only have six months, you only have 10 sessions. Whatever arbitrary systems are put in place, they make it really hard. But what I'd really like to talk about today, uh, which is why Sarah is here, is so what about our own agency and feelings as people providing that support? What's getting in the way for us as well? So on that note, I will hand over to Sarah and uh, I will be monitoring the chat. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in there. Thanks. Thank you all. Yeah, just to say that um, this is uh, about dialogue. So um, I really believe in the power of community and I think something about being in groups and in community is about being seen and heard. But to do that with you guys, I need you to either turn your camera or your mic on or add to the chat or contribute um, so if there are parts of you that are kind of finding it difficult to find your voice today, that, that's fine. If there are others who've got parts of them that are really keen um, or, or maybe there's parts of you that are really sceptical. But either way, if you can find that part that kind of is able to contribute to this, seeing it as part of community today, that would be amazing for me. And then it gives me things to kind of bounce off. So thank you. And um, this first point is about taking care of ourselves, which I, I know we often do that at the beginning of webinars and training and things like that flippantly sometimes and sometimes meaningfully. I guess today I want to really work on the meaningful end of that because endings um, in the relationships that we have with people through work um, often bring up endings and I, um, thoughts or memories about losses that we've experienced personally as well. So. Or, or even with maybe we had a really difficult end with somebody, somebody or maybe something tragic happened. You don't know what um, yeah, might come up for people. So I want you to just give yourselves permission to kind of check out physically. If you need to literally leave and come back, that's absolutely fine. Or just mentally check out and do your shopping list in your head. That's also fine. Um, thank you. Oh, can you do the next slide? Is that all right? It's okay. Thank you. So I've got some questions here, if it's all right to kind of hear people's with some of the responses. Um, endings are something that I talk about in my own supervision as a psychologist a lot. <laughs> I think that they are, endings are one of the most complex parts of the work that we do. And um, there's often an assumption that we can kind of give, have a magic formula and then uh, uh, you know, it might be six sessions or 12 sessions and people will be, might be very clear about that from the beginning and then assume that the ending will be okay because everybody's kind of understood. But when you get towards the end, lots of different feelings about the endings can come up or people might do all sorts of things. They might, um, yeah, yeah, just not turn up. Um, they might kind of sack you in a very big way or they might really have a sense that this isn't enough and how are we gonna manage this when this doesn't feel like enough from them or they've opened up and things are tricky and I don't feel like I'm leaving them all sorts of things that can come up that are really important. We, what we, for all of us, I guess, the best that we can probably wish for is that for it to be a mutually agreed ending with a shared sense of satisfaction about what's been changed through the relationship. But I want to <laughs> ask you, yeah, how often do you think that happens? How often do you think you get to that shared sense of satisfaction and an agreement about an ending? What kind of percentage would you say? So feel free to pop in the chat or if people want to raise their hands, if you've got any thoughts, we'll call on you based on the order you raise your hands, basically. Uh, Minky. Thank you. If it's easier, I, it's easier for me to talk than type, if that's all that's right. That's fine, because yeah. my brain works faster than my fingers, so. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I recently had to go through something similar because I worked for the bus project for the wallet and unfortunately the funding has stopped for that very um, important and, and very useful project and we couldn't find any ways to carry on. So uh, what we had to do, we had, we had a nice plan 
moving along like an exit plan and we started well we created that exit plan together with our service user so mm. it was all focused on how they would imagine the ending happen for them yeah and what we can do to make it happen but um it was quite it still it was I still found it quite a painful um experience yeah. to go through when you have to say to your clients because we gave like long-term support as well because with the wallet we recognize that people who's in the middle of changing their lives in any way shape or form they need time yeah and we gotta give them the time to heal and recover and to put themselves back together and be at the foundation that they that they're not gonna fall apart from so all of a sudden we were supporting someone for like a year and a half and then oh. you gotta say, right, this is unfortunately this is coming it. to an end. Yeah. Mm. 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 I think it sounds like you really planned that well, but you're right. That's another potential end point, isn't it? When our services change or get decommissioned or any any of those reasons that, that it doesn't fit that sense of yeah, shared satisfaction and a mutually agreed ending, that there's often things in 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 services or in our own lives or their lives that mean that's it it's coming to an end quickly yeah but it sounds like you planned that in, in the best way that you could yeah and talked about it which is like key to this I think often yeah. for me talking about endings from the beginning is, is part of the work that we do thank you for sharing that Does anyone else kind of what's your there sense of how often a hand raised from SOC MOKU I'm not sure if that's a yeah yeah, hi, good morning. My name is Budupe and I'm a social worker. Um, so I work with the, the local authority and within the team called the Reablement Team, um, which means that we have to work um, in line with the hospital um, discharge team and Pathway One service to just to make sure that people have achievable goals on discharge when they're back home. And this is just a short term service, which means that you don't have long, long kind of time to work with the person. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think it's quite difficult sometimes when I'm having conversations with my manager about this, it's about you build a relationship with the person with lived experience and within those six weeks, cause you're going out to see them, you're reviewing how they are, improving in their in their achievable goals um mm. but as well as also making the, the the person with lived experience aware that this is a short-term service so that it's there at the beginning about the understanding but yeah. when the package is when, meant to come to an end it's quite difficult because they've already built that rapport and relationship with you and I'm trying to explain to them oh this might be the last time I will be seeing you um, I wouldn't be able to act on your case anymore. However, yeah. but there is still a service or uh, a team you can contact in case you need any further help. So having this, this discussion in supervision can be hard as well because sometimes you think, oh, I've, what have I really done to support this person to help them achieve their goals mm. within that time frame? And you can see what you've done based on feedback. Yeah. Sometimes as well, you're thinking, oh, I wish I could do more because there are yeah. some people who don't achieve those goals within that time frame and they need they still need long term intervention. But you're not in that capacity because of your team remit. So yeah. it, it can be difficult to 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 say goodbye at it a particular point in time. And I think you're raising something really important, which is when that, yeah, the, there's a gap between what you maybe think is the right thing to do or how much more you should be able to offer when your service, it can't fit with that. And sometimes if the gap gets too big, that becomes difficult for us. It's that like moral problem about, am I doing the right thing now? Or what do I have to do if I can't do what I think is right? Um, but short-term services, yeah. And what you bring to that kind of, yeah your mindset I guess about what you bring to that your experience of and um, beliefs and ideas about what help should be like is short term can it be useful having the confidence to know it can be useful <laughs> but it is just often a stepping stone for people a leg up to something else and how do you bridge that then ending of your relationship onto something else all kind of loads of dynamics there that you've pulled out thank thank you for that one of the comment on the chat from Rachel um, 
saying that the support they offer is only six weeks during crisis. Um, yeah. so, so some people are ready to move on. However, the more complex cases are very difficult, even if you put a plan in place. Um, and so with a very small number being very intense, they don't want to lose the support. Um, and some of them have got quite a risk of coming back into crisis when they leave. So they try and get their care coordinator involved to give reassurance um, and also to remind them regularly how much they have, how much time they have left. Um, but also she's made the point that it's not just the service because sometimes they get very connected personally to their case holder yeah. and those become very difficult. And Rachel, if you've got other things to add on that, please come in. But I think that's a really yeah well summarised issue. Absolutely. And your and your point is yeah, really important there. It's about what we what what we feel about the ending as well, isn't it? And the loss of the, of the relationship that we've just built. I think something about being in a crisis with someone as well, really being alongside them and then being seen and heard by you. So in a sense, you're meeting those attachment needs um really well and then saying bye when things are still very difficult. Um yeah, then it's a this particular kind of relationship that you're building and able in in order to do that isn't it so I think you're right that's another emotional complexity of this and just um, um, as I know you probably want to uh, need to move on as well so okay. got a really good um kind of I suppose counterpoint from Tamden um in the chat as well talking about a kind of local area coordination approach and they're really lucky to be able to work without a time limit and they're allowed to take a step back and, and meet people on their terms not the services terms as well so yeah that sounds really really exciting terms in when the time is right so, yeah i'm just really we can actually take a step back because people were ready yeah okay yeah that's some that's an ideal ending isn't it that sounds absolutely brilliant yeah about the relationship rather than the service enabling people to kind of yeah have that agency about when the next step is and s sometimes that yeah and that sounds absolutely ideal and then there's a bit part of me that's thinking also um um if if it's if, if it's always led by the person I wonder if some there's just sometimes the potential to get stuck there as well isn't it um but but on a but mostly that sounds absolutely brilliant thank you Tamsin yeah okay sometimes not always yeah okay so yeah so the rate of unplanned endings um I think probably most of us would say that unplanned endings happen then for lots of different reasons, what we're bringing to it as a service, as a person, and the person that we're supporting as a person as well. Um, and it sounds like some people are doing thinking, especially in, those of you in short-term services, about endings from the beginning, which I think is actually a really crucial part of this and how we manage it. Um, lots of reasons why this um, will make it hard, and we'll come on to that um, in a minute as well. Um, I know that for myself, like when in supervision or management supervision, when you start have to, where you know you're going to be asked to take on someone else and how many people have you closed, it can be a, um, you start to kind of think in your head, oh, how do I, how do I work out how to get more for this person? Or how do I, or, or do I actually really, do I need that supervision in order to reflect on, no, that is enough, it is good enough um, and, and how I move people on. But um, yeah, I, I think, um how you feel as supervision says something about what you're bringing to endings as a person. Can you move on for me all? Thanks. So there is a link um, between our attachment styles. So that's how we are in significant relationships with someone that, um, is, that, that is there who's got our back, who's our go-to person, if you like. So with children growing up, this would be usually parents or carers and then as we get older it's usually our partner or still our parents or someone significant that's been an important person in our life it might be a really key friendship so attachment relationships probably all know it's not just about love and it's not just about any relationship it's a, about a particular relationship with someone that's got your back yeah so there is a link between our attachment style and how we are in attachment relationships um, and our, pro our approach to endings and separations generally. And that is, our separations through the day happen frequently, don't they? When we just say goodbye to someone or when we come home and we say hello to someone or when we check in on the phone and we ring someone or that when it's our go-to person, those separations and, uh, and, end and endings are happening all the time. Um, so I would like you to think if you can um, about the significant people in your life and how they do their hellos and goodbyes with you 
And I wonder if anyone can say something about that. So I'll give you some examples. Um, so in my life, so my mum, for example, is if I go to her house, she she the door will be open. She won't come to the door to say hello. She'll probably be sat or doing whatever she's doing. I walk in and it's me that makes her a cup of tea. So there's a 30 second window into who takes care of who in that relationship <laughs> and why I might be a psychologist. But <laughs> the opposite will be if I go to my dad's house, then um, my dad is the sort of person that when he's saying goodbye, he will stand on the doorstep and wave to you until he can't see your car, until it's round the corner. So you know when you want to get in the car and just like check your message, put something in Google Maps to you. I mean, can't do that. I have to get, I have to drive away around the corner, stop. And because otherwise I'll leave my dad on the doorstep just waving and smiling at me. So it makes you feel very seen and heard and heard and valued and loved. It's also slightly logistically annoying. But that's, I would love you to share if you can, like how, what's your experience of hellos and good guys and how do people do that with you? And how does it make you feel? Yeah. Minky, I can see you've got your hand up. Yes, yeah, sorry. So what I do with my children um, is instead of saying when they go to school, like, oh, have a good day, I always say to them, make your day happy. And in oh. the beginning, they ask me, they were like, mum, why are you so annoying? Why do you always say make your day happy? No one says that. Mm. And I said to them, it's because you always got two choices when you wake up in the morning. You're either going to be miserable or you're going to be happy. And you mm. are the only person who was in charge of your happiness. So if you decide that I'm going to make my day happy, then no matter what people are going to do, nobody's going to put ruin it for you because you already made the decision that you're going to have a happy day. So I always say to them, make your day happy. Minky, I love that because it's there's something about really anchoring them, yeah, in an in, in an intention for their day. It's an intention for their day, isn't it? That you're and also how um uh yeah how important that will be to hear that same thing from you every time they say goodbye there's something really reassuring about that when you say the same thing isn't it to a, to a child thank you for sharing that um hi sorry i haven't got the camera on the internet's not brilliant today actually so it cuts in and out sorry apologies um my mum as opposed to my sister so my mum whenever i see my mum it's most days of the week we always end on a hug that physical yeah. There's always yeah. a hug, goodbye. Whereas my sister, bye. <laughs> she's off. She's off in another room. You're out. In fact, you're lucky to get the goodbye. You know what I mean? When you go and do it, <laughs> you do what needs to be done, and then you go. You stand there and think, oh, she's busy now. I'll I'll leave. Um, <laughs> whereas my mum is very very tactile. Yeah. Um, well, so it's and... that difficulty in other relationships where I'm quite tactile. I like hugs, hugs and care. I like that sort of physical contact. But you have to gauge that. Because not everybody does. So you can throw yourself in for a hug and go, whoa. Hang on a yeah, minute. yeah. I'm back yeah. Um, so it's making that judgment on the people you know well. But you know that with people you know well, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Understand uh, yeah, that. that's true. There's a, Yeah, for some, like you can judge whether it's okay to go in for a hug or not. <laughs> absolutely with your mum, that's like a, that's her way. And I, I can hear that kind of... Um, joy in your voice a bit when you say that about your mum and yeah how you've come to understand that's your sister's way of doing things as well not take it personally that's just her <laughs> yeah thank you we've had um I I just used my provision did my own comment which is to say by wider family we used to do ritualized goodbyes we had to say goodbye to uh kind of every auntie uncle cousin second cousin twice removed before we were allowed to leave a party um, <laughs> so, um rachel said uh, she thinks her loved ones know her too well so when uh, she arrives home or visits her family they always ask do you want a cup of tea but also there's lots of physical contact when they say goodbye oh that's really nice yeah yeah absolutely so they so they know what you need and they anticipate it and they and they yeah do it so um yeah, and also the physical side of it as well. All yours made me laugh. But I also wondered whether how you felt about that because when I read it or hear it, I think actually there's something really important about that that everybody will be seen and heard. But whether it's also frustrating. <laughs> yeah, there's both, isn't it? So yeah, everyone gets seen and heard, and everyone's sort of in that sense treated equally. Um, but then also it, it's very easy then to forget. So I'm from a massive Catholic family. I'm one of six. My mum's one of twelve. So there's just hundreds of people at a party, and yeah, if you miss one, 
Yes. <laughs> you know, so there's a, um, yeah, it's really lovely because there's a big family kind of unit there, but also there's a bit of a, oh, what if you, what if someone happened to be having a wee when you were saying goodbye and you don't hear the end of it? So, yeah, it's uh, yeah, that you, interesting. What if, you were, what if you missed someone out or what if you were the one missed out? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So, yeah, I, there's honestly in psychology, in terms of the hellos and goodbyes as a snippet of someone's relationship tells you so much about whether they can welcome you in um what their expectations are how well they anticipate your needs whether you're yeah I guess it's I've said a lot about being seen and heard but for some people it's seen heard and felt isn't it like that embodied part of it and the hugs and the physical presence or the kind of flitting off and saying goodbye and kind of how you make sense of that did they do they mean that is that personal do I matter or is it is that just how they are and their mind is a bit scattered and that's 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 okay um uh, they are little windows so that's on a small level but you can imagine that on a bigger level like how ending uh, an ending of a relationship is a is a much bigger separation and how you do that is really important in, in terms of um how both parties are left feeling and I've put here like when you were younger um, and Minky sort of mentioned this about her children but thinking about when you got dropped off at school how um your parent or carer did that and what was the message that you got um how we do that passing over is is in, really important if if a, I think we all know don't we that if a parent hesitates then it then the message is um, my parent isn't sure whether I'm okay so so there you're going to internalize I'm not sure whether I'm in, okay so when we do that in our endings of people just on a session ending but then on a bigger scale at the end of our work if we are hesitating we're going to give people the message I'm not sure you're going to be okay without me and and if that gets internalized oh they're not sure I am going to be okay maybe I'm not maybe I'm not going to be okay that's a really difficult way to end. So um, it's not necessarily about tr being inauthentic about that. If you are hesitating about things, it's it's also about thinking, OK, then I'm not sure about the person I'm handing them over to or the service or the support or the community that I'm handing over to. And that's a bit of work that we need to think about, because if you haven't got trust in a teacher or a, a carer that your hand or child might, whoever it is, um, then that, that's probably the issue then, isn't it? That I, I'm not exactly trusting of the people that are caring for my child and all that gets picked up on by the child in the middle. What we want is for us to, in a sense, have um, some, you know, that our job is to hand them over in a really confident way, giving them the message that they've got this and giving them the message that we know the person taking care of them is going to be a, a, uh, there as well so uh, so if we bring that into the adult world and not to infantilize it, it is still an important way maybe of framing it of thinking it's not that I need someone to take care of you or hand or, or hand over to you in a in a childcare type way but in a I know you're going to be okay because you're in this network you're connected and uh, even if there's not external people there to kind of hand over to or another service that you're handing over to it's I know you're going to be okay because I know you've internalized enough of our relationship in your mind that I might be a voice. I might, there might be a part of you that can hear my voice internally and, and my voice will be saying, I know you've got this still. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, and that's that next point really about do relationships ever really end we do often internalize and we want and that's why we particularly do that with attachment type relationships we internalize that person what they might say or do if they were that could work negatively as well can't it you can be do, do something and feel full of guilt because we think that person would be not agreeing about what we should what we're doing or the decisions we're making or they might be making us hesitate or things like that it can work in a negative as well but hopefully in terms of your relationships with people it's a, it's in a positive way that they have a lot of confidence and faith in me they know I can do this um that they know I need to be kind I know I need to be kind to myself I know that's what they would be saying to me that's the kind of messages we're hoping people internalize from from us isn't it and when the connection in our mind gets too loose from the people that are important to us, we often do feel like we need to turn back to them. So that's that like coming back to us again, maybe sometimes seen as a revolving door, but I can hear the dog barking, sorry. Um, that yeah, that you, it, it, it's also a natural part of turning back towards people and the help that, that we've had or, or been offered before. 
So um, the way that we do endings with people can often replicate our early relationships as well. So thinking about us as helpers. Um, okay. I'm just going to pause while she turn on to the next slide. Mute for a second. Okay, thanks. So you, some of you have done circle of security, looked at this model of circle of security um, before, is that right? Or? Uh, we've covered it in the mental health session, which I'm not sure was recorded, but it's probably helpful to give a brief overview, I think, given kind of just some new people logged on. Okay, so this, um, so circle of security is a model for attachment relationships. So, um, Although there's pictures of children here, um, that's because it was it, it's been developed in some children's services. But this is a this is a model that's relevant to all of us, universally, um, uh, in whatever age whatever age we're at. Um, uh, so you might um, so you might yourself be that person that's the pair of hands on the circle. When you were growing up, that would have been your parent or carer. It can also be that person might be your partner or significant person in your life but you can think of it as you with the people that you're going out to support so these um, pictures and the words next to them they describe the needs on the circle so you're a secure base so um, yeah you're the secure base from which you support people to kind of go off on the top of the circle to go out explore their world to take risks climb trees whatever it is um, and their needs are to, to have someone watch over them to have someone delight in them just for who they are, not for anything they've done, not their milestones that they've achieved or anything like that. And that is an important part of the work that we do, I think. We can be very goals-based, goals are important, but actually in terms of being a human being and having that reconnection that you need for good mental health is about having someone delight in you just for who you are. It's also about help. So we need to support people and help people on the top that's a tricky thing to do because if we if we offer too much help then we are infantilizing people you know what it's like ourselves to be offered help with something that we already know how to do it feels horrible and patronizing often and equally to be not off offered enough help for someone to assume that we can do something that we can't and we know that they could help us with it can feel like they're deliberately withholding that help um and it makes us also feel very vulnerable um, to be the one without the power when someone else has the power to be able to do something that we we need help with and then also enjoy with me people you know children and all of us we need people to enjoy enjoy life and enjoy things and enjoy moments with us moments of laughter and connection and just that that shared sense of um yeah having something wonderful to think about or to connect on bottom of the circle then needs uh welcoming people coming back to you so that's you when you're saying hello yeah how do you welcome them do you see them do you notice them are you there um we also need people to protect us um if people don't protect us with some things but others then we start to trust whether they we can you know, doubt whether we can really trust them to protect us we need people to comfort us when we're in distress. we also need people to delight in us that doesn't mean delight when you're having a bad time, but but to think that you're still the best thing in the world, even when things are not going well, and that you're an okay person. And we need to organise people's feelings. So that's another way of saying emotional regulation and doing that regulation with someone. Um, so you know, when we're when we're saying goodbye to someone, we're we're doing that. How do we support them around the circle? How do we help them to go off? And, and then when they're coming back for um, support from us, we're asking them to turn towards us as a safe pair of hands on the circle. And we're trying to balance being bigger, stronger and wiser and kind and have that balance of that. Um, so, so when things go awry, it might be that you people have had an experience of not ever having a safe pair of hands on the circle. If they haven't had that in their life and then they've got that for the first time, that can feel amazing or it can feel really scary, or both. It can feel like, I can't trust that that person's gonna be there for me, so how am I gonna to turn to them for help? I've never experienced something like this. I've never experienced someone being there. I'm gonna, you know, and a lot of work you're doing is encouraging people to turn towards you for that help and support and to let you be there. Um, I'm just, yeah, wondering whether I should check in all about whether this makes sense to people.
Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. I was nodding vigorously. I'm not sure if you yeah. did. So yeah, I think that's with with with. Yeah. Yeah, I said a lot then. But is this really familiar? Is this, can you imagine this in your mind? Yeah, I was just thinking about this and something in the other slide you were talking about in, in terms of um, separation anxiety, that thing. I was thinking about the dog when you're trying to get your dog to get used to you not being here. And sometimes it's knowing that you're going to come back. It's knowing that you're going to, like your children at school, when you were talking about taking children to school, they need to know you're going to be there to pick them up at the end of the day. That's yeah. part of that anxiety. And it's the same with the dog. You know, they just need to know you're going to come back. And once you come back in the room, you then extend it to 20 minutes. Then you go out for an hour, but you come back. They get used to the fact you're going to come back. Do you understand what I mean? That sort of it, exactly being trusted enough to go, but actually come back as well. Absolutely. And that you're not going to reject them, abandon, abandon them, them, not be yeah. there, abandon them. Yeah, absolutely. So that um, the circles get bigger. So you can imagine a circle, can't you? Like when it's toddlers, you can imagine um, them crawling away, coming back to you. They check in, check you're still there. <laughs> oh, as we get older, we go further. You can imagine like footsteps going out to play, come back to the footsteps. You know, you can imagine them on the floor. It's mapped out as a circle. And then, yeah, then we go much further and we go for longer. And we still have a sense of security that someone is there with us. And that's uh, often when we replicate that in relationships, that's what we want to do in a way. And I think services sometimes do in the frequency that we put our sessions in. We start off with more frequent, then we gradually move them further, bigger gaps. Yeah, and that's that's doing that naturally. It's saying, I know you can go further and longer without me, and I'm and I'm going to still be here, and you can test that out, and you can come back. Yeah. Thank you, Kath. What do other people think when they hear this? Can I say something? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, what I what my first initial thought was is that I I feel like that we create fears in people, and we 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 create like fears in our children as well when they're growing up because if they see us be scared of something, they're gonna react to it that way. So if we if we like you said as well, if we always show that confidence to our clients mm -hmm. and say that we're gonna be there. You can go, you can explore, but I'm going to be here when you need it. That's massive, I believe. Mm. And um, yeah. and yeah, and just not creating fears in them or giving them more insecurities that they already have and just build them up so they feel the confidence in themselves. So like you said, to go further and further and do more and more. And it's fantastic to see when you see someone who's like socially so isolated and then they completely change within months and months and months. And you see that it's because you 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 focused on their, their strength and focused on their power and you build them up and give them the confidence. And um, yeah, I don't know Absolutely. where I wanted to go with that. but Yeah, um, no, I think that's, thank you for saying that. I think that's right. It is about, um, yeah, seeing the best in people, isn't it? It's what they're capable of. And yeah, how we see them is really important. And often we're trying to see them in a way that perhaps they can't see themselves. So that message we give, and that it also includes our confidence that we know that they can manage an ending and that we and that it isn't going to be a replication of um, earlier um, attachment wounds or abandonments or difficulties. Because often the people we're seeing haven't had that safe pair of hands on this circle, yeah. Or they have had a parent that, or, or care that's maybe taken one hand off or not been there at all. So that might be if you've grown up with, you know, people and drug um, parents who've uh, had drug or alcohol or very extreme um, mental health difficulties that have impacted on their parenting. I'm saying that carefully because not obviously it doesn't make you a bad parent if you've got mental health difficulties it's the impact isn't it on you and your relationship but it can take you off your mind isn't there your body is there your hands are literally there but your mind is not with with that child that's very scary then to not have had that and so you offering help as a per, uh, um as a person as a safe pair of hands might feel so alien to them it might be really difficult we also all have had um experiences because none of us do this perfectly right um and and we would have had experiences of our own parents struggling on one side of the circle probably more than others so we might have had parents who found it difficult to let us go 
or had found it difficult to let's explore who wanted to just be um there with us all the time or kind of hyper focused on us and that might be for different reasons if you're born prematurely or you had difficulties with health early on you you might have needed to be there you might have needed to watch over your child and then as they've got better and older and, and more able to adapt to whatever's going on for them or they, they've recovered from something um our old feelings are still there so we keep them close because letting them go feels too scary or on the bottom it might be that closeness has been for whatever reason a very difficult thing so any sense of someone needing us and coming in on the bottom or any sense of dependency might have felt very diff difficult for our parents and so then it would feel very difficult for us we've got that legacy um of of struggles on the circle that then influence the way we are in relationships um and that and that we can bring to our helping relationships too so it might you know you see this with the people sometimes we can get in people might get into that kind of being the hero type um rescuing type role and they're really pulling people in on the bottom of the circle but then that's them struggling with the top of the circle a bit more and, and perhaps needing to do that kind of thinking about where where you are and how you shore up your sense of being okay so that you can kind of get out of that heroic rescuing role and you can balance you can do your balancing a bit better bigger stronger wiser and kind both parts of the circle are important um yeah um um yeah it might be yeah people um who do the opposite of that who who struggle with the bottom and then they're always pushing people to be dependent dependent uh, independent 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 like i need you to be independent i need you not to need me i need you to be empowered without any sense of having the connection on the bottom like we can't do that empowering and support to go out without also doing the bottom um part of the circle as well so um it, that's important just to work that out in terms of how we're approaching endings right so if we're struggling if we all, always think oh but they need us um we're gonna find that hard um equally if we're pushing too much on the you must never need me then they're going to find that hard and we're going to find that hard too when they when it feels like they haven't quite reached their goals or when the ending isn't happening and there's frustration about that often it's coming back to a sense of balance yeah okay does anyone want to comment on that before i move on I think that's everyone. So, oh, sorry, now. I feel like there are, are times when you kind of have, I mean, I find this constantly where you have to leave somebody knowing that they've not had the support that they deserve. Um, mm. And it's it's quite, I think, finding that balance between giving off an I know that you're going to be okay. Mm. Also acknowledging we're forcing you to, to show a level of um, resilience that nobody should have to display. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think there's, yeah. there's something around leaving people in those conditions where, where when we're trying to portray, um, I know you're going to be okay. We come out with, you're so resilient you've got so much resilience and the person on the other end is it. it's like well I don't really have a choice in this um and it can actually be yeah. really frustrating um yeah and it yeah. can make I think it can make you kind of want not to be okay to prove that that you shouldn't have to to kind of uh spend this much energy on on just surviving uh and yeah the the balance there of of showing I know this is unfair but I also know that you can hack it um and acknowledging you know what this is rubbish I'm really sorry oh absolutely yeah I totally agree with you because because if we because it sounds like we're being forced to kind of push them away on the top of the circle and we're not and if we, when they haven't got enough of a safety net on the bottom right so that which isn't okay that isn't a balance so yeah I think I think you're right but you've said it really beautifully now is it yeah that um yeah we we know you're going to be okay but it also it isn't okay it isn't okay but we know you'll find a way through when you get what you need and that 
that isn't that isn't what where you're at right now but there is a sense of like mm, the potential for moral injury there isn't there it comes up that that idea about moral injury when what we are, are what we're having to do doesn't fit with our morals like we're, we're have if we're having come up against that a lot like saying goodbye to someone when we haven't got in place what they need or and, and that feels wrong exactly. to us it's really difficult I yeah. think especially when when you're looking at multiple dis- disadvantage and things like with not quite enough come up again and again and again and again it can also over time kind of erode people's sense of self-worth if there's this kind of yeah, you can look after yourself now. You'll you'll be fine. Um, yeah, absolutely. It kind of can yeah. kind of create a sense of okay, so other people deserve this and need this, but I don't. And yeah. yeah, like it's I I think we've said everything that we need to say. I just wanted to acknowledge that that's a a real complexity. No, it is absolutely huge. It's huge, isn't it? It's quite, uh, yeah, um, when you leave a relationship in those circumstances, it can be difficult. And I guess setting up from the beginning that um. Yeah, because you alone might not be able to resolve all of those issues. That is about, yeah, who else is there and what else is there that needs to be? And how can I be part of your journey with this? And how can I say goodbye in a really, in a in a good way? Um, but being seen and heard and valued is, a, what, is about what um, Circle of Security is about, isn't it? Often you have, people haven't had that experience early on and they're having that experience with you and that there is something powerful in that but being seen might be you being seen as as you are and accepted as you are and people acknowledging you haven't had this and that's really tough and you did deserve this it wasn't anything about um you you as a person or what you deserved or didn't deserve yeah sometimes only saying those things out loud can be the only thing that we can do yeah and recognizing the power power difference and the power imbalances um the impact on people's internal worlds as well yeah thank you now okay I think I need to whiz through a bit oh don't I'm taking a bit too long (laughs) I I think the conversation's happy I also think um, I've kind of taken a decision just to update people that we'll just keep talking I think and going through the slides normally we have a bit of reflection space at the end but because the whole presentation is kind of reflective and people are talking yeah yeah, we'll manage the timing so yeah you take as long as you need Sarah but I thank thank you everyone for this one thank so, you yeah, I'll move the slide on thanks okay so there's a um this is about people's relationship to help so we all um um oh no you were going to say this actually oh you do it this is your broad patterns. Yes, from, I've just realised. Really nice Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, th- this was um a really interesting thing we found when we were delivering the coaching work within um platform, and and what we found was um three. I think did we say three? Um, yeah, three very sort of broad patterns of people's kind of engagement. The first one was was people um kind of really didn't like or or didn't trust or found uncomfortable the idea that we were asking them what they wanted um like for some people it was the first time they'd been asked that and uh or at least first time they'd been asked and and it been a genuine um kind of question um so there are a kind of group of people who kind of panicked um and i hate the word disengaged but they disengaged for a couple of weeks, couple of months, because they went, that can't be true. And we kept just saying, no, it's up to you. What what do you want to work on? That That's what the offer is. That's what the work is. You know, it's up to you. Um, you know, and obviously we would help people unpick things. We wouldn't sort of say, well, this is a really complex situation. What do you want to do about it? We would say, obviously, we can give you support and advice, but actually what, what is most important to you? And, and people didn't trust us. So there was um, people who completely disengaged for the first first few uh, sessions or, or months, and um, who then suddenly came back. So so the, that was kind of one one type of engagement pattern. The other one was um, people who um, kind of arrived, and for the first time, someone was listening to them, um, and so their worries completely and utterly spiked really really quickly so um we actually saw people sometimes in the first three four six months um getting worse 
um, because for the first time in their life, again, they had someone listening to them. Uh, and so all of these things, kind of like what you were sell saying previous now, you know, all of these experiences, all of this lack of support from services, all of the things that have been really bothering them for, for decades in many cases, suddenly came out and uh, and they were held and 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 but there, there aren't enough services support out there. So suddenly people's well-being just absolutely plummeted. And what we did there was just keep holding that that space and and keep listening and and it was really helpful that we were able to offer quite a long period of support. Um, but the reason why it's helpful to include, I suppose, in this conversation, and I don't have the answers, I wish I did, um, it is that that was also part of the ending this conversation because how can you leave someone who's worse after talking to you? Um, how can you end that support? But actually, a lot of the time, that was really important that they not that they felt worse, but that they actually articulated all of their needs. And what we had to realize that it wasn't our job to fix all of those needs. It was our job to help them through those first conversations. And yeah, you know, on paper with commissioners, for a few of those people, our service looked awful. Um, and we just had to sit with that as an organization and not put the pressure on the people we were working with to make us look good. Um, and that that just took tough conversations. So, yeah, we have so we say to commissioners, yeah, some people will come to our service and they will leave worse. And we're comfortable with that. We're not comfortable if it's something we could help. So if there's something we can help with and they leave worse, we've got to have serious conversations with ourselves. But if they arrive and we give them a space to say, actually, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to get this support from the NHS, I need to have this conversation with my family, I need to get onto the housing, but you know, whatever it is, well, we can't fix all of that. It's not not within our pattern. And then there's um again a, a second, third kind of pattern, which is people engage with us really quickly. Um, and they they suddenly were listened to and they started to feel really happy, content. Their well-being scores went up really well. Um, and then in a few months, suddenly it either plateaued at, or, or plummeted. Uh, and it was really then hard because that was when people, um, the way I articulate that, and Sarah's probably got um, uh, the, the, the psychological terms for it, but it was almost like people were fawning. You know, so people were trying to make us think that they were doing really well or maybe tell us that they were kind of working on their early kind of goals. But actually what it meant was people were trying to tell us what what we wanted to hear. And actually it took them a bit longer to build up trust to say, actually, no, I'm not doing OK. And this is what the real issue is. Um, and linked to that, I know I've said this before in, in some of these strength based programs, but it's really for me, part of endings is also dictated by what you're working on with someone and and the challenges to kind of services in the third sector so one of the proudest achievements for our coaching service is that we managed to support one of our the people we were working with um to move from heroin to crack cocaine now that's not something that we can write to a local authority commissioner and say you know job done because obviously it's not but for that man's quality of life phenomenal he left the house he connected to family and friends and so on paper his outcomes you know for a local authority might not might not look much better but for us and for him as a person he his life was transformed but what's really tricky is when we start monitoring ourselves by what we're achieving rather than what people want that's what gets really hard so those were kind of the three things that we'd kind of picked up on um, in terms of the way we work with people. Um, it's obviously much more complex than three broad patterns, but I thought that was helpful to kind of set set the tone. Thanks. Thanks all. Yeah. And it, it is similar in therapeutic relationships to the, 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 the different patterns. So you, you can get that kind of, first of all, that in, you can get that really increase in well-being first off. And it might be because of fawning, you're right, like people pleasing. Um, that you learn to do to keep safe and to suss out with how you make someone happy with you and how you stay connected uh, it can also be a genuine sense of just like relief that someone gets me and, and understood then as you go through the relationship things inevitably come up that make you feel a bit more vulnerable and that can be a really hard place to be so sometimes it can seem like things are getting worse and people might jump ship them they might say that's it and this is too much I'm, I'm out of here and then there might be all sorts of ways in which people manage blame and shame about that so services sometimes can manage that by saying they wouldn't engage or I offered it but they couldn't take it up or whatever slight slight blaming of the person 
Um, and the person might do the same, like bl blaming, they were rubbish, they didn't help me, they couldn't give me what I wanted, they offered me this, and da, 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 da. so that's often man trying to manage shame about finding it hard to be in a relationship where you're vulnerable. And then therapeutic relationships where you could push past that, where you can make that, you know, when you're in a vulnerable place, there is an authentic part of it and you can really do some of the work if you like um once you could push past that then the, the people had the better outcomes but that takes time like if someone was saying to you i'm going to change your life in um you know in in six weeks you'd think it's going to like i'm going to i've got something it's going to transform your life in six weeks you'd think it was snake oil right you would be really wondering is what on earth is this about and it really takes us often just as humans a lot of time to kind of build up that trust so I was thinking about people at the beginning saying about the crisis service and things like that yeah you have to work so hard to kind of get that connection when someone's in a very vulnerable position don't you and then saying goodbye can be really tough at that point um and it's hoping that they've had enough of a sense of someone being on the circle for them, uh, for them that they take that into future relationships. Or maybe I can trust that someone will get me. Maybe I can trust that someone might be there for me. Um, yeah. Are there comments or that we can yeah, that Two, I was going to, because I think I saw your hand go up earlier, Tamsin, in the previous one. I don't know if you want to talk through what you've just said. I think you'll do it more justice than I will reading it. Um. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying that I think sometimes as a like a professional or a practitioner, it's so, and if you know that there's a time limit, it, you're so tempted to just seek the quick wins and it would just be so easy if you could just use your knowledge and expertise just to solve that little problem. And that kind of compounds over a period of time where actually it's like, you have to ask yourself, who's in the driving seat here? How helpful am I being? Like it just becomes really blur blurry. And I think that, just this idea of really being conscious about holding yourself back and kind of waiting but in a really safe way it's not about not doing the stuff for people it's just about making sure that when you do step in it's the most appropriate at that time and, and the thing that you're not kind of taking something away from other people or you're not you know stealing their best lines when they're having sort of an epiphany about what's going on you, you really just allow the person to do that stuff and you're alongside them that can be so powerful and I think that that yeah it's just really hard so holding back the whole time I think you know is much more su su sustainable if you are working towards an ending because you get to that point where it is an ending and people feel ready for it because you have just been there and you, you kind of can test you know you can prove it because you haven't actually done anything concrete you've just been there alongside the person as they've kind of been doing whatever it was that they wanted to do to help themselves but it is tricky and it is a practice and I think it just requires so much conversation and reflection to, to keep holding back I think that's a really lovely way to describe it yeah I, I guess yeah fits for me about that yeah not being tempted to be the hero in a sense isn't it yeah yeah like you say and sometimes quick wins are important but actually it I think what you're saying is about holding your mind on the long term and what is going to be transformational and um yeah can be it, yeah can be absolutely worth it and the relationship of being alongside someone is everything isn't it thank you Tamsin and um, we've got I was just gonna Rachel if you're comfortable speaking as well uh, Rachel's made two really good points if you're not comfortable we can just read them out but I those are really good comments. I, I wondered if you wanted to expand on them. Yeah, sure. So, so I think just in, in response to Tamsin's on that one um, is that our organisation acknowledges that uh, wins are actually on a spectrum. So one person, you might get them back into the community, doing voluntary support, things like that. And that, that can be seen as a big win. But actually, um, for others, it is literally just supporting them through the the actual time that you're with them um mm. and and listening to them and them feeling heard and that's still a win um mm. it might not feel like a big win mm. but it it's a win it is, of course yeah um, yeah yeah, and and the other point that i was just making is that uh, we found that um if somebody feels very much heard and understood by their case holder we then have the problem that if we go off sick or if we go on annual leave, they actually won't see anybody else during that period. Um, and they will, uh, you know, as Oliver says, don't really like to use the word, but they, they do kind of disengage with the service during that time. Okay. Um, and that, that can be quite difficult. 
yeah. especially with us being just a six week intensive service. Okay, yeah, thank you, Rachel. I think that's interesting. It maybe speaks to something to me that may be a bit beyond our remit today, but thinking about that, yeah, when we become a safe pair of hands on a circle, but the person hasn't really found that for themselves inside themselves yet. That can be problematic when we disappear. They and it can because it can trigger all of these different thick things or feelings of feeling abandoned. So then turning away, uh, uh, turning away from help because I'm not going to let myself feel vulnerable again, or whatever that is, whatever it is for them. Um, but yeah, as how we find um, help people find a sense of the the, the balance of the hands in, inside them internally or or whatever you want to call that, but that connection with yourself that is often lost, especially in relation to mental health problems. And like reconnect to that part of you that can be there for you um, when the when the external person is not there for you. I think that in some ways has got to become part of our work, but um, that might be beyond this now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Rachel. That um, I think you're right about the winds as well, being on a spectrum. That's a nice way to say it. Okay. okay, we'll move the slide forward. Okay. So what we also mean by our relationship to help um, um, is about both parties coming to the relationship with a complex set of beliefs about the helping process and what it means to turn towards help and what it means to offer help. So we might have family and cultural ideas about how you, know, you, you only rely on um, your own family for help or you... Or, or maybe that nobody, you can't rely on anybody in your family for help, or that external people need to do things for you, or um, um, or rescue you, or um, you can't really trust certain people, so there's certain things that you can't say. Um, um, there can be all sorts of different ideas, basically, that we come to the process, and our own self-reflection about that is really important. The relationship uh, that we have to help, to help, and helping can be a repetition of earlier family relationships. I've said a bit about that with the circle of security. If you didn't have someone there with you, then maybe it's um, harder to trust that someone, you can trust your vulnerability with somebody, for example, um, because your parents are your first set of helpers. So it becomes a model for other relationships that you have. It might be that you experience very difficult abuse in your family and that you maybe tried to tell someone how they responded to that the first time will be a model for you about how you expect other people to respond so if they met you with empathy and compassion and someone believed you and someone helped you to do something or to stop it happening or to seek justice then you'll have a certain model of an expectation right versus if nobody believed you or you were met with hostility or you were the one that was scapegoated or rejected or ostracized so your expectations are going to be largely um informed by by those experiences and then when what we see it we might see someone coming to us with um who kind of in a hostile way rejects our help and discharges themselves or ends it or someone that wants us to be what they didn't get earlier on and be there forever and if we can't be there forever then we will it feels like we've abandoned them or we're not good enough or that we haven't um been able to help them of course that's met with our own expectations and that can be a really difficult combination if we all if we think um I don't want someone to infantilize me and you're met with someone that hasn't ever had someone there so wants you forever um then <laughs> that's a difficult combination right and you might get a little bit stuck with someone when you're trying to just push them to be independent and they've got this wonderful suddenly experience of someone that can be there and they want you to be there um how you figure out that ending is hard um yeah so uh, yeah and often the people that wrote this paper reader and fredman are systemic therapists and they bring in psychoanalytic ideas about this as well and they refer to people and particularly sort of the mothers that they were seeing that had uh, experienced sexual abuse themselves so trying really desperately seeking help and really urgently wanting help but then as soon as it's offered not able to do that and that often you know because of the sense of i can't quite trust that i'm desperate to say this but then having previously been met with hostility, they're really scared to see what happens next and whether actually anything can be done. So endings happen for all sorts of reasons in that way. And that's why talking about endings as we are from the beginning and what people's experience of help was will help you work out how you plan that ending. So if you know that they, if you know that it's been really hard for them to trust help, 
um, before, or you know they've kind of sacked previous 10 workers, um, you can ask them, like, what was it that didn't feel right? When does it start to get difficult? And how will I know if it's getting difficult? I'm only able to offer a little bit and that might not feel enough. What's that going to be like potentially? And how can we kind of manage that together? Because it might be that you always feel like you get a little bit and it's never enough or that someone starts something and doesn't follow it through. So if that's been your, a lot of your experience before, I don't want to replicate that. I want to, I want to be with you. And um, perhaps we decide together that we can only begin to think about what you might do in the future, not do it, not do it yet, but just even talk about the doing together if that feels like enough um yeah what do you think when we say i say that are people thinking about their own expectations of help and maybe help that they had in the past that was good or not good i think um minky has her hand up Yes. Uh, well, the first thing that came to my mind is a saying that to be the kinds of person who you needed when you were growing up. Yes. So that's what I'm always trying to do because um, I, I, my, my, my bringing up it wasn't the best. So I had haven't had the secure relationships, and I didn't really have um, any security from my caregivers really. So I had to grow up like pretty quick and learn to do things for myself. So I really struggled for years to how to ask for help. Mm. Even when I asked for help when I was a child, I was met with like, you're lying or this is not true. Or, mm. you know, mm. so all my yeah. issues was always, no, it's, it's all in your head. It's not real. It's this and that. Mm. So um, it did take a while. But once you actually allow yourself to, to feel and be vulnerable in front of people, it's amazing that how much your life can just change. Mm. And, and how much it's actually life gets so much easier and obviously mm. hyper independence is a trauma reaction which we come across with quite a few people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh I don't know where I'm going with this but um no, I, I think of Minky I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts as well and and your vulnerability and sharing that too but I, I just was one thinking then how amazing it would be for you to be able to have those conversations with the people you support because as well as you being that as a helper the person that you wanted to have or needed growing up maybe you're encouraging them to be that for themselves too um yeah yeah, yeah. I'm quite yeah. fortunate in my job because I worked as a peer mentor for for a while and I'm working as a lived experience uh, coordinator so I'm mm. able to use my experiences and I'm able to share as much of my story as I feel relevant with my clients so yeah. straight away gives us a common ground and they yeah. straight away build the trust better. Yeah. So I think using our lived experiences and be able to talk about them can be really helpful with the people who we support. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess sharing your experience of pushing through that vulnerability in order for life to get better. You, you could, those are the conversations I think are really useful for people for managing endings as well and saying if and we get to a point where you feel positive, vulnerable positive yeah. can come out and you yeah, can absolutely. turn any negative into something positive yeah. and you're just saying out loud you can just say out loud like I, I know what it feels like to be there in a way and I also know what it feels to stick with it when you stick with being vulnerable with someone and if you feel like that sometimes people are, go into fight or flight if I notice that about you what should I do what would be the best thing for me to do um that kind of thing thank you my hand up uh, feature doesn't work hi um, hi Mia Frank from Paris um in light of the the three patterns Oliver described uh, mm -hmm. that it's maybe not possible uh for people to receive help given their history and, and current state and uh, what we just saw that it may be not possible for us to provide help the way they would want, like the ones who want it forever because they mm -hmm. never experienced healthy attachment before. Um, how do you manage the fact that the KPIs and the, the way the feedback is collected and the outcomes are measured, uh, doesn't really take the reality of people's psyche and and um, unmet and unmeetable through the program needs into account. 
Sounds like Oliver said they were very courageous uh, about that and, and communicated to the people yes. monitoring yeah. their uh, progress that some people will have this reaction due to this and that's okay. But more generally, it feels like all these support relationships have to incorporate this somehow and the, the pressure on the, the caregiver is transferred to the care receiver. Oh, do you want to should I say something about that? Do you want to, Jim? Uh, yeah, because I uh, yeah. hear hear what you were saying on as well about, yeah, I think um, you're right about being courageous about saying to commissioners, this is how it is. This is about the, the messiness of being human and of helping that it's not there's no one fits size one size fits all and we all bring to things like complications and we have to what best find a way forward together with that um but because i think you're right there is there is um often unrealistic expectations aren't there i'm just going to move move this if we've had um someone's asked if we can have a short break i think we've only got one slide left anyway sarah so um, should we, if we can wrap up the slides and then we'll have a break and I'll wrap up the slides. wider yeah. discussion. And we'll go back to that point. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so just overall, I guess it's thinking about how you prepare for endings from the beginning. How do you do that self-reflection for yourself in your own supervision or in your own um, mind and give people the confidence to go into the world without contact from you? if the more you can set this up and reflect on their experience of help and, and also think about your own experience of help from the beginning, the better. Um, if you think about the circle, can we give them permission to come back when they need to? Can we talk with them about in, internalizing some of this help and helping relationship in their minds? And that point about, can you be the person that you need for yourself as well when I'm not there? Can you anticipate with people what when when things get tricky, given your experience, this is, this is what's likely to happen, what would be best for me at that point? Um, and yeah, can we kind of bring all different parts of us, the hesitant, the cynical, the hopeful parts into our helping relationship and name them and, and, and anticipate them in relation to endings and then find that wise part of us that does that balance of, um accepting when it hasn't been enough and acknowledging that with somebody but but valuing and seeing them in the best possible way with the best possible chance that things will be okay for them so that helping them to hold on to some hope um without being unrealistic unrealistic and without making them feel it's all their responsibility which is important too so i guess i'm saying the more question the more that we question this and the more we'll have it in mind the more we can have conversations with people from the beginning and we can let them know I know I think this might be really difficult this ending because it might bring up things from previously when people have left how can we make this different for us how can we hold it in our hearts and our minds in a really good way I'm going to finish there thanks all